I'd like to welcome everyone to the third part of a class on Husbands, Wives, and Human Dignity um, in the Talmud by Miriam Goodweiser. Um, you might remember her bio from past weeks, so we're just going to fast forward past that and, <laughs> and just say that we encourage you to ask questions. Please unmute yourself, post in the chat. We encourage your active participation. Please turn on your video if you're comfortable. And with that, Miriam, take it away. Hi, thanks. So welcome back. Um, so I discovered that the best way to plan the next week is to plan too much for the week before and then come back to it the next week. So that's sort of what I'm going to do. But so basically, just to give a little preview. Um, today, I want to return to the story we didn't learn last time. If you weren't here, that's fine. Um, and I took, I took to heart the feedback that some of the things we're learning are kind of downers. So we're going to, I'm going to, I think, try and, and learn a similar lesson from a more positive relationship, let's say at the end. Um, and I'm hoping next week to keep with the theme, but move towards a little bit of a meta direction, not like rabbis of the Talmud and their wives so much, excuse me, as like, you know, rabbinic commentaries on um, biblical marriages, let's say, or biblical relationships and how that keys into some of these themes. That's sort of where I'm, I'm head. I hope I'm headed. So I will share my version of this screen if I can, which is right here so I can talk about it. Um, so last week we started with the sugi in, in Kedushin. I sort of, I'm, I just brought the beginning to re refresh, pe re refresh people's recollections. Um, Okay, so I started this, we started the Sugi and and I think we, we talked about like the Satan and the Satan's many disguises, right, the, sort of the tempter, um, and how he can disguise himself as a woman, or an attractive woman, or a repulsive beggar, um, and we'll see. Um, and I think that that already, so one of the things I tried to say, right, there, there's a series of stories of rabbis who sort of are, are taken in by Satan appearing as an attractive woman, and then Satan sort of shows them that they're worthless, and this, this sort of is encouraging you to maybe treat people in your life with more suspicion. Um, and then there's a story of this sort of well-off guy named Polimo, who... Um, is taken in by Satan posing as a beggar. And the moral of the story, among others, seems to be that he should have been more compassionate toward Polimo. He should have more seen him as sort of a person worthy of respect than as somebody sort of gross and like, just get out of my way. Um, and I guess where I left off is like, is there, you know, we have, when, when it's, when it's woman, they're sort of like, stay away, they're scary. And then when we have a beggar, we can, there's a, he's still scary and gross and other things and definitely sort of like othered as some people pointed out last week. But there's also, a, the point of the story seems to be about the interpersonal relationship with him or at least sort of like the, the respect that you owe him as another human being. So I wanted to go to the next story in this sequence and see if maybe we can import that idea of sort of other people require your respect into this next story. Um, or rather, we can, whether this next story can help us import that into the area of husband-wife relations. Um, so uh, just as a warning, this is one of those stories where it's like a, um, the, less, the lesson comes from the path not taken, meaning if only they had done something better, maybe they would have had a better outcome. So just FYI. Um, and in the context of the story, this also there's also a progression, right, where you have the rabbis who sort of think that they they mock transgressors and then it turns out they can be taken in by satan so then polemo that says oh i know satan is a danger so he's going to poke satan in the eye with an arrow i just asked my students to draw gear up and sitna on their exam some of them were very cute where right? they're going to poke him in the eye and um or i don't know if they're going to poke him or they're going to shoot him in the eye and um right and then satan is like actually don't don't say that either right it's, it's one thing to acknowledge that i exist but you also have to acknowledge that i can't you can't overcome me alone you need god so that's one of the messages of the Polimo story. The next line is somebody who tried that and still maybe didn't work out as well as he wanted. So I guess I'll read, right? Rabbi Chia Barashi, Havaragil Kol Idan to have a Napala. Right, so Rabbi Chia Barashi, he used to, every time that he would do Nifilat Apayim, right, what we call Tachanun, um, I think it was less scripted in their time. Right now it's sort of, there's Tachanun today, there's no Tachanun today, and then everyone kind of mumbles it if you go to Morning Minion or if you've ever experienced that. But um, I think in their time, it was more more sort of a personal prayer. And it's actually, there, there's at least one other story I'm thinking of where the, the husband's Tachanun is sort of a private moment that the wife overhears, as we're going to see, right? It's sort of like his personal pouring himself, his heart out to God, and it's happening in his home. Um, 
And he used to say, Harachaman Yetzilenu Miyetzahara, right? Which is similar to Rahman and Nigar Veba Satan, right? He seems like he's doing what Satan said. It's not as adversarial towards Satan, right? Let the merciful, it's not let the merciful one rebuke Satan. May, right? May the merciful one save us from the evil inclination, right? Rahmana and Harachaman are the same. Rahmana is an Aramaic, so the definite article is an Aleph at the end of the word for those who like that sort of thing. Um, Okay, so Rahman is leading me to Sarah, right? Like he says, may, like the, the merciful one, God should save us, uh, interesting plural, from the Yetzir Hara temptation. In this case, the evil inclination is specific, is sexual, as we're going to see, right? Yochad, one day, so he used to do this all the time, right? One day, Sham Atinhu Devitu, his wife heard him, Amra, and she said, Let's leave it at that. Michte hakashane de parish laminai, right? If it's been so many years that he's been separating himself from me, meaning we haven't had sex, my time akamarachi. Why is he saying this? So, what's her question? And then who's she talking to? Is it interesting? I think important. Right? It's been so many years that he's separated from me. So, why is he saying this? to have no evil inclination. So. He seems to have no inclination for sex, so why right. is he saying it? Right, if he's not even sleeping with me, his wife, why is he so worried about the evil inclination? It seems like that's not his biggest temptation. Right, so that's sort of the way she hears what he says. And it's interesting, right, she says, but she's not talking to him, she's talking about him, which is going to become important, okay? So she sort of, she wonders, right, like, that's weird. Why is he so preoccupied with avoiding, like, sexual temptation? He's apparently pretty at it, right? Um, because he hasn't been having sex with me. Um, and she might have assumed, right, that, like, he was too old or something, right? We don't know how old they are, but, like, she, she probably, she, it sounds like she assumed that it's not that he's avoiding sex with her because either of something that she did or or like some something in their relationship, or because you know he thinks that sex is evil, but because he's just sort of like moved past that stage in life, right? Is, that, it possible, is it possible that she thinks maybe he's having a relation with another woman? Okay, so maybe she thinks, right? If he's not having sex with me, who's he talking about? Right. Which that that reading may be supported in what comes later, though I'm not sure. I mean, it's not and, very and nice to say about him, but and, it's my. <laughs> and possible. is it possible that? he thinks that having sex with her would be giving into the evil inclination and that what he's praying for is the strength to keep not having sex with her? It's possible. I, that's to me the most straightforward reading though, as we'll see, well, we'll see, right? So I think, right, it seems to me like my, my sense is at this point in the story, right? She's discovered that he's been intentionally avoiding sleeping with her because he wants to suppress his whole sex, his sexuality. And she's like, wait, that's weird, right? Um, and so what's the, what could be a solution to that situation? So, so you could like talk about it, for example, she, should, she could seduce him. Right. So she's going to do that, but in a, perhaps in a way we'll see, right. In it. Okay. So Yohan, another day, right? So one day she heard this. And so like, it's, it's like this sort of snapshots, right? We start off, he says this every day. One day his wife hears him. Another day she marinates it on, on it for a while. He's learning Torah in the garden, in the courtyard, whatever it is. He's learning in the garden. We'll come back to the garden. So she dresses herself up. She changes the Tanya Kamei and she sort of shows up with him. Um, she adorned herself and repeated, she chalfa, she sort of goes, she keeps on walking past him to sort of get his attention. Like he's in, he's in the garden, right? He's not in the home. At the beginning, it seems like he's in the home, right? And she overhears him. Now he's in the garden, maybe to get away from her. We don't know, right? So she comes out all dressed up. Um, but it's not exactly as Susan said, because he said, man at, who are you? Right? He doesn't recognize her. Right? Weird. Okay. Amra ana haruta dehadri miyoma. So she said, I am this person, haruta, um, which a lot of the translations say this is, you know, she's the name of like a well known courtesan. I don't know. And I've returned, well, so they translate as returning from my day at work. I think there's a little ambiguity as to whether there's an implication that he's known her previously. I don't know, known biblically, but sort of like had some interaction with her. 
maybe not. Maybe she's just saying like, oh, I'm on my way home from work. So interesting that you noticed me just when I was walking by, right, the seventh time. Um, so she she says, I'm this person, and Chiva'a, right? Litvoa is sort of like, they translate it as he propositioned her. Um, it's like this weird word that exists in biblical Hebrew, which means like basically a man says like, I want to have sex with you, and then you do. Um, which is sort of, I don't know exactly what words they would use, but okay. So he propositioned her, but it seems, it's like a very direct thing to say, right? And she says, Amrale, so she sort of makes him work for it. She says, right? Well, why don't you go get for me um, that pomegranate from the top of the tree, right? I don't know if it's, they, the English here adds as payment. Let's leave that aside, right? Give me the pomegranate from the tree. He does, right? Um, Shavar Azel Atini. So he does, he goes and brings it to her, you know, fade to black, but we all are supposed to guess what happens. Okay. Um, so Ki Atalavete, then he returns home, right? So basically, we have our scene, we're in the fourth scene. Our Bichia Barashi used to say, right, save me from the evil inclination. His wife hears it, she thinks about it for a while. She dresses up as another woman, right? And sort of seduces him essentially or lets him think that he's seducing her i don't know right and then he comes back home right and she's he has an atelavete hava kashagra devitu tanura and she's just like stoking the fire as if nothing has happened right she's like you know making pancakes i don't know um although the fire metaphor may be or image may be a little bit interesting right salik the kayati begava and he went and sat in it um, so what kind of an oven is this? I don't know the mechanics of this. I always think about the end of the movie Gattaca when I read this, but I don't think that's exactly what it is. The fireplace. Um, right, it could be a fireplace, right? Or it's, some, it's somehow open. I don't think he's like climbing into a small opening, but he's sitting in something. I don't know if it's like how on fire it is yet, but we're going to see that it's not, this is not the safest activity. Um, so she's stoking the, I don't know where it's supposed to be some kind of a, and closed up in eyes. So, like, so he sits in it. I'm running my high, and she's like, "What are you doing?" Right? Which is interesting because she knows what just happened, right? And he tells her like, "This whole thing happened to me," right? Meaning, you know, like, "I'm really sorry, honey. I just did this terrible thing." What did you say? Happened to him? Or this whole thing just happened? Oh. This have um, a This this is what occurred. This is the incident that just occurred, right? Um, he doesn't say city, right? I didn't. He definitely doesn't say I did it, right? He says this is what happened, right? Amrale, Ana Havai. So she says, "Well, it was me. You're in luck, right?" Lo Ashgachba, but he didn't want to listen to her, right? He was just like, "You're just, he, so okay." He didn't lo Ashgachba means he didn't pay any attention to her. What does that mean? He didn't pay attention to her. So I assume he's not actually sitting in the fireplace for this whole conversation, by the way. But like, I don't know. He didn't, he didn't believe that she said it was I. Right. I think. He thinks, so why would she say that if it wasn't true? You think that's it? Or you think based on what's coming up, he, he doesn't care whether it was she. Right. So that's does. the other option is he doesn't believe her or he doesn't care. And it seems like maybe it's a little bit of both, right? But why would she lie about that if it's he doesn't believe her? Make him feel better. Right. Maybe he thinks like, you know, and it's almost like compounding his guilt because he's like, I have this lovely wife and she just wants to make me feel better, but she doesn't understand how terrible a person I am. I slept with someone else, right? Um, so I don't know. Okay. Um, so she he didn't believe her. So it sounded like he literally didn't believe her until she showed him the signs. What's the sign? The pomegranate. Yeah, here's the pomegranate that you gave me, remember? Right, so now she's proven to him. Maybe he didn't tell her that part of the story, or maybe he did, but she has the pomegranate, so she's proven to him that it was, in fact, her, right? Amrala, so then he says, Ana miha, nevertheless, I li I still intended to sin. Even though, like, I believe you now that it was you, it doesn't matter, I still feel terrible because I didn't know it was you at the time. And then we have a series of... Um, in a second, right? He sort of fasted for his whole life until he died by that death. What is that death? I don't know if it's the injury starvation. in the oven. I don't know if it's starvation. I don't know if it's just like a general weakening, right? Um, basically, he um, like, he's like, you know, Minister Dimsdale with the heart. Is that his name? 
<laughs> right. Like he's he's been he's been self-flagellating essentially um, until he sort of shortens his own life out of guilt. So this sounds so much like the story of Tamar and Yehuda. Yes. So one of the things I was going to say, I think there's actually two biblical intertexts. You like that word? Fancy intertexts. Um, right. But I think there's two and that's one of them. Do you want to explain why? Because he thinks he's having sex with a prostitute. It turns out to be somebody who's actually permitted to him. Um, there's signs that she keeps in order to prove it to him. But the difference is that Yehuda was Modeva Davar, and this guy is like self-flagellating, and that's like a big difference. Right. So Yehuda and Tamar, right? Tamar. Well, Tamar also gets right. Tamar's goal is what? It's not to relieve Yehuda's sexual urges. No, it has to do with the whole lost yibum opportunity issue right she wants to get pregnant from somebody with yehuda's genes like yehuda himself will do great for that right um whereas here she's i mean i don't know people often read the stories if they're older she's not getting pregnant it seems right but she um it's not she's not she's sort of trying to manage her husband's relationship to his sexuality which is a little different right um and right okay so that's the, the Tamar sort of parallel. If we took the Tamar parallel further, right, Yehuda is supposed to recognize that, like, he did something wrong to Tamar by basically preventing her from getting remarried, right? Yehuda has three sons. Tamar is married to the first, he dies, she marries the second, he dies, she marries the third, or she doesn't marry the third, she's supposed to marry the third. So she can't marry anyone else because she kind of, like, belongs to this family because they don't have children, but she can't marry the son because Yehuda doesn't want her to because he thinks she is, like, a black widow. So, um, Fine. So like, right, Tamar is sort of, she's acting on her own behalf, but she's also acting on behalf of sort of like the right and the good. Um, and who is this woman? Okay, explain. In, in both cases. She's acting on her own behalf because he hasn't been satisfying her sexual needs or whatever, or, or at least his conjugal relation, his conjugal responsibilities. And right. the good too, that he has a he has responsibilities to her and he she is trying to she is taking advantage of his sexual urges in order to show him what's right much like tamar right so it seems right it seems like when you say to show him what's right it seems like she does have kind of a didactic purpose similar to the satan in the previous stories right who's not just there to torment you but is trying to teach you something it seems like like what did she think was going to happen Presumably she was going to tell him at some point. Maybe not. Maybe she was never going to tell him. But it, uh, it seems very likely maybe the reason, for example, she asked for the pomegranate is because she was going to tell him. Somehow she thought this is a better way, trick him into having sex and then talk about why we have him in having sex as opposed to talk about it first, right? That's sort of maybe going to be part of the problem. But um, right, she seems to have thought that this was like the better way to sort of get what she, not just like a one-time interaction with him but sort of maybe change course in their relationship um so in some ways i think that like she's kind of a tamar figure the difference is that like tamar is i mean tamar is so, right so there's a few differences but one is like afterwards yehuda is like oh yeah you're right i treated you wrong and here the husband like he doesn't how he has been treating her is completely absent from his his calculation right it's all about him his kavana his relationship to sex and like you know, I did the wrong thing because I intended to sleep with someone else. And like, he doesn't even, he doesn't seem to stop to think, why would you feel the need to do this, right? Um, so I think, right, like he he does not rise to the occasion. One, one I think, very plausible reading of the whole Yehuda and Tamar story in Genesis 38 is that, right, like Yehuda sort of rises to the occasion for the first time in his life, 37, I don't remember, right? Um, and sort of takes responsibility for what he's done or not done. And that's good. Um, so here, right, the husband sort of totally fails to, he's, so it's interesting, he's trying to take responsibility, right? He's trying to be like, I've done something terrible, and I need to, um, you know, I need to atone for it or something. But here, I think I'm getting a little feedback. So but he misses the point. Right. He, he still doesn't really get that, like when Yehuda says, Sadkami Meni, right? First of all, it's about her. She is more... Well, there's two ways of reading. Either she's more righteous than I, or she's she's righteous 
it's my child, right? I didn't give her to my son, right? What he has done to her features into his recognition of what he's done wrong. Whereas here, like the wife is totally ancillary to the husband's own frame of mind. So, okay. So I think that this sort of story, before we talk about the second biblical intertext, shall we say, right? This story is a, right? The fact that he doesn't recognize her is sort of the symbol of the total breakdown in communication between them in some way. Right? So like, the second intertextual story is is Ruth and Boaz? Um, maybe that's the third. <laughs> it could be. Um, so one sec, right? So there, there's something about, right? Like the fact that he doesn't recognize that she's able to trick him shows how distant they are. And they're sort of like, it's not, she's not totally blameless here either in the sense of like, she does trick him, right? She doesn't try and sort of seduce him in the, within the normal terms of their marriage, right? So um, why she feels like she has to do that is interesting, but okay. So the second thing I was thinking of, okay, where is he? He's in the house a lot. And then he goes into the garden and he meets this woman and he brings her a fruit. Adam and Chava. Right. So he's kind of like, it's a little bit Adam and Chava. It's a little bit reversed, right? right? Because he brings her the fruit, not she brings him the fruit. Um, and she's, she, I, I don't know. One thing I was thinking of as I took a little walk this afternoon, I was like, right, maybe what's happening is she thinks she's Tamar, right? She's the one who's going to show him the light by initially tricking him. And then he's going to be like, oh, you're right, right? But he thinks she's like the snake, basically, right? That like, you know, she's tricked him in a bad way. She's put him in the position of Chava having to go get the fruit and sort of sinning and like breaching a barrier that can never be repaired unto death. Right. Um, and like that's sort of an irreparable or unbridgeable divergence in their opinion, their sort of views of the situation. Um, so this is sort of sad. I think it's a sad ending. Um, it can be sad for the wife also, right? It's sad for both of them. Um, right. <laughs> Thank you, Viva. Right? Like, she, um, can everybody see the chat or is it just me? Yeah. Okay, right. Yeah. That, like, she's, it's sort of like, right, he starts with, like, save me from sin, save me from sin. And, yeah, it is sort of an interesting parody. It's, it's like validating this idea that like men are so out of control. Like one, they can have like a one second lapse and they'll just do anything, right? Um, I don't know if that's exactly what you meant, but right, like there's, there's something there of sort of like, you know, and he doesn't even care who it is, but right? he has his wife this whole time and he's been so focused on avoiding his wife and then like two seconds in the garden and some lady shows up and he's like, oh, okay. Um, so right, like it is kind of, it's kind of mocking him. I think it's kind of, it's judging her, like she's still, whatever else you want to say, she's still in the position like the Satan of being, the woman is the temptress, right? She's trying to spin that and fails in some fundamental way, right? She's trying to be positively, right? To sort of use temptation in a positive way and show him that he's wrong about always trying to avoid it, but that doesn't really work. Um, so I think that like, you know, in terms of escaping as I was saying, right, if we want to sort of import the interpersonal connections of the Polimo story into this story, it's, I think they're there in the sense that like the lack of communication in the marriage is the background to everything that happens, but it doesn't, the lesson isn't learned in the way that maybe it is in the, even in the Polimo story, right? Like it's there, it's a big part of what goes wrong, but it's not part of how they fix it. Um, yeah. Interesting, if he's the Satan. Um, right, in, in sort of like the inside the house, he could be, he's sort of, I don't know if he's the Satan, he's trying, he is the person who's tempted, right? Um, but he, she is like, inside the house, she's sort of like the potential beggar who he's supposed to pay attention to and doesn't, I, I might say, right? Outside the house, she becomes the Satan, it seems to me, right? But then he sort of resents her for putting, for making him feel like he has, I don't know, but I. Can I can I ask you a quick question? Sorry, please. Um, could it be, and I and I know this is completely like in a different way, but could be the Gemara is trying to teach us, and maybe the lesson wasn't learned on both sides, that yes, there are times, unfortunately, in a marriage where sex breaks down because they, you know, because they've been around, they've been together for a very long time. And sometimes 
there needs to be something done to spice it up, maybe doing something different. She dresses up and which tempted him, which made him excited. That got him excited. That obviously made him forget and 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 we was able to overcome whatever it was, but he didn't understand that because obviously he thought he did something wrong instead of looking at it in as a way of a positive, healthy way of, you know, c- continuing marriage and sex even as you get older and you've been together for such a long time. I mean, is that something that would be even considered or like just because the Gemara has it, therefore that's not, you know. I think it's possible, right? I Meaning that's sort of like a, a sympathetic reading of her is that she's, it's not that like she can't talk to him so she concocts this whole ruse, but that she's trying to show him that there's still something new here, right? Maybe, I mean, I, I actually am, in the Tamar context, this also happens. Maybe she doesn't expect him not to recognize her, right? Maybe Harut, like, a lot of people like the translation will say Haruta is a person, right? Maybe what, what does Haruta mean? Right, like it's like like Harut, like freedom. She's sort of she's she's sort of taking on this name that has maybe to her like obviously symbolic connotations, and she expects her husband of however many years to recognize her, even if she's wearing makeup, right? Um, maybe not, but like uh, so that and that's actually a reading of. I've written about this elsewhere. I happen to be, I, I discovered it like two or three years ago in one of the, I think, I think maybe Radak, it's very interesting, right? Who says that Tamar never intended to seduce Yehuda. She thought she'd go out and have a conversation with him. And when he couldn't recognize her, that's sort of on him. And then she sort of had to go with his plan B, right? Um, in which case, like, yeah, maybe that's happening here. Um, okay, right. So like there's, I think there's different levels of sympathy that you can you can give to Mrs. Um, Mrs. Chayavarava in this story, um, right? Like, is is this a mutual breakdown in communication or is she really like serving in a in a sort of positive didactic role that he kind of misses? Um, okay. And then the, it concludes with a series of sort of quasi-halachic, I don't know halachic, but like more halachic um, statements about, um, you know, about how, how bad, right? Like, even if you, if you thought you were doing something forbidden and it was really ended up being prohibited you still are bad basically <laughs> right we'll just read the last one maybe um right Rabbi Akiva ki have a ma- I mean, the last one the middle one ki have a mati the high pasuk have about Rabbi Hugo would cry when he came to this pasuk right the pasuk of Isha um oh, so the okay oh, can't pick up in the middle right um a woman who makes a vow can they can be undone by her husbands and then the the pasuk seems to say Hashem Yislach la right? Because her husband undoes her vow, so God will forgive her. And from the rabbi's perspective, they're like, well, if the vow is undone, what is there to forgive, right? Um, so the answer is, they come, it, in some ways, the shot seems to be, if your vow is undone, you still, there's still a problem in some meta sense of you made a commitment that you're not keeping, okay? But, uh, um, you know, the rabbis are sort of like, well, if the vow is undone, she didn't do anything wrong. So they come up with this case where like, she didn't know the vow was undone and she violated it. So technically she hasn't done anything wrong, but she's still done something wrong in sort of her internal state of mind. And Rabbi Akiva used to cry about this because he says, right, even if somebody who sort of like intended to do something wrong and accidentally got saved from doing it, all the more so somebody who actually sins, right? Presumably like referring to himself and sins that he has, he has done. Um, so, right, that's sort of the, the framing here in some way, and like the framing, if we think about the whole sugya, on some level, the perspective is very much like, it's so hard to avoid temptation. And like, we men have to torture ourselves and be constantly vigilant because we never know what's, when, like, when it's gonna arise. But to me, the story with the wife, as opposed to the Satan, has to also bring in the other voice, which is like, maybe you've been torturing yourself about something that there was a better path for you, right? Um, than sort of like trying to avoid the Yetzirah. Maybe casting your wife as the Yetzirah was the mistake, right? As opposed to like the Yetzirah could be like the actual woman who are walking around in your garden who apparently don't actually exist, right? But your wife is not the Yetzirah. Um, okay. So I think that like- I mean, do, Miriam, do you want to go into a discussion of why he might be afraid of his own inclinations? Why he would- feel that his wife represented some aspect of his Yetzirah? Um, sure. Or is that just too far? I mean, I mean, it's a little far, but I'm not really. I mean, I think, you know, in some ways I see when he goes into the garden is he's, he's trying to escape like the whole idea of domestic life, right? 
like it seems like he's his preoccupation is Torah study in some ways. And this is a segue actually, right? His preoccupation is learning Torah and communing with God and his sexual life and even his family life or his home life is a distraction from that, right? That seems to me to be the, the most, let's say like self-evident reason or motive that he might have, but I'd be open to hearing others. I mean, there's sort of an ascetic personality that, sa that says, you know, the reason I need to be ascetic is because if I give myself an inch, I'll want a mile. Right. Maybe he feels like he can't differentiate um, or control himself or in general, or that he, that, all, that it's not just that pleasure is a distraction from, or like family life is a distraction from Torah, but that like pleasure is bad, right? There is an ascetic strain in Judaism, even if it's not like the only or the dominant one. Um, people don't, people like to pretend that's not true, but I think it is. Um, so yeah, I think that like his motive is sort of an interesting question. It's hard, it's, again, it's always hard to know when you're reading a stack text like this, like maybe the text like thinks that he's right, but I don't think so. It's hard to read it without a little, at least some judgment on him for having done this and then sort of like left her in the dark about it. Right? And so like, what about for not recognizing his wife? Um, it's an interesting question. I don't know. So let's go back. I mean, there is sort of a men are clueless strain and men don't know where the children's pajamas are when the wife is in the hospital giving birth to the next baby, you know, but I don't know. I'm, I'm disappointed in him for not recognizing her. Let's put it that way. Yeah, I, I hear that. Um, and I think, yeah, I mean, that whole interaction just seems like really bizarre, right? It's kind of like a caricature right like like he's sort of this man who's been praying every day to be saved from sexual temptation sees a beautiful woman for the first time in however many years and is like oh right like the cartoon man with the eyes popping out of the head um oh yeah. that must be a good idea right like what um but although it does harken back to the stories at the beginning of this passage about the rabbis who see satan in the top of the tree and are like oh let's go get that right like he climbs the tree um like he sort of will climb the tree in this story also to get the pomegranate so like you know, the, I think there's a simple reading of this whole suya that it's all basically about that, like actually being constantly vigilant against sexual temptation is good and that's what men need to do. But it's hard for me to read the story as just saying that, right? It seems to be also saying that like, right, if you're married, there's another path, right? Um, and in fact, where did it go? It calls him kol yamapshalatot sadiq, right? It calls him righteous, so I think, I mean, maybe it's, I don't know how much, how redemptively one can read this, but um, I think that, you know, at the same level, he has actually done something wrong by the end. It may not be the thing that he thinks is wrong, right? Yes, men not recognizing their wives is a common trope. I'll get to that in a second, right? Um, right. He's done, he's definitely done something wrong, right? It may not be the thing he thinks is wrong, but he's done something wrong. So I think that like, um, in some ways, right, one reading of the story is like, he thought that the thing he was doing wrong was having sex at all, right? And it turns out that the thing he did wrong was, you know, ignore his wife, basically, right? And because of that, he comes into the situation where he can no longer have a positive sexual relationship with her, right? Where like, having sex with her actually is a problem now, because there's this gap between them. I don't know. Um, right, so there is this common thing called, it's called the they call it the bed trick. When I went to the University of Chicago, Wendy Doniger, who's a professor there, had just written this book called The Bed Trick and it was like everywhere. It's like a cross-cultural myth thing. I, I actually never read the books, but I know that that's what it's called. So I'll say that, right? It's like, it appears in a lot of cultures, right? Stories about men not recognizing women when they sleep with them, right? We have it in even Rachel and Leah, right? They get switched. Um, and it, it appears in a lot of kind of stories, right? That, you know, not recognizing someone, but, um, Therefore, what, right? Sort of like who's being judged in those circumstances, I think is then like a second, second order question. Okay. So maybe we'll take a little detour. We'll see a story about that. This is gonna be another downer, but it'll be shorter. Um, so this is, this is on the topic of uh, men not recognizing wives. Um, Ha'ish mitzuve al peria And again, I think that there's a redemptive reading line, or not redemptive, but sort of like critical reading line a little under the surface, right? Um, so 
as some of us may be aware, right? Men are commanded that the mitzvah to be fruitful and multiply applies to men, but not women. This is a Mishnah from Ivamot. Why it's in Ivamot? Okay, right? Rabbi Yochanan ben Brokomer al Shnehu. Rabbi Yochanan ben Broka actually thinks it applies to both of them. Okay, fine. But the halacha is the mitzvah applies to men and not to women. And now we're going to have a story that kind of illustrates what are some of the, like, so what? Meaning one, what we call a nafkamina, right? Like one practical ramification of that distinction is, for example, if somebody is unmarried, maybe, and has no children, maybe a man has an obligation to find a partner in order to have children and a woman doesn't, let's say. Now a woman may have like social obligations or like in these days, sort of the need to eat, but if she's wealthy and she doesn't want to get married, it's okay, whereas for a man, maybe it's not. Um, or right, can a man who wants to get remarried marry somebody he knows can't have children if he doesn't have children or does he have to find somebody who can have children if he can right in their day maybe that was a little easier um meaning like nowadays we tend to think of like we tend to think there's not just like oh like well you, if you don't want to marry her just marry someone else right it's not like it doesn't work that well but maybe it did more for them okay so now we have these this little story you and Chizkiah were twins right and they they became fully formed at different times so there's this sort of Roman, I think, medical idea that babies can be fully, can gestate for either seven or nine months, but not eight, um, which has many halachic ramifications. And here we have twins and they are gestate, gestating for different periods of time. The implication being one is born, literally born after seven months and the wife remains pregnant or the mom remains pregnant for two months and then delivers the second one. Um, I think there actually are, I don't know, uh, all I know about this, I learned from ER back in the day on TV, that there, there is a very rare condition where a woman can have two uteruses and potentially something like this can happen. Um, sounds very unpleasant, but okay, which is going to be part of the point, right? Um, so Yehudi, David, and Rabbi Chia have a letzar leda, right? There, Yehudi, Rabbi Chia's wife, who I think is their mother, as we're going to see, right? She had a lot of sort of suffering or pain with childbirth, right? No joke. That sounds really unpleasant, right? So she changed her clothes and she came to her bichia as if she's just like a random woman off the street asking a Shiloh. She said it's a woman commanded to, to be fruitful and multiply, right? So he said no, not knowing that she was his wife. So she went and drank a sterilizing potion, they call it. Um, I think they did have somewhat effective potable contraceptives, at least at various points in the ancient world. One of my friends who studied this told me that there was some, I don't think it was a contraceptive, it was like an abor a plant that caused uh, miscarriages or abortions that was harvested to extinction in the Roman period. Um, so that's kind of an interesting thing to know, right? So she has something that either will work or she thinks will work. So she sterilizes herself because she doesn't want to get pregnant again because this, this whole thing with the having twins was like impossible for her, right? The Sophie Glymel, so eventually it comes out because it turns out you can't really like, you, it's hard to keep secrets forever, right? Amar la, iku yalat li I wish I could have had another pair of twins from you before you would have done that, um, right? And then, right, it turns out he actually has two pairs of twins. Maybe they were both very unpleasant for her to give birth to. And he wishes he could have had a third. And she says, no, thank you. Sorry, Charlie. Um, so, I, first of all, I, I like to teach this in conjunction with the other story, just the idea of sort of people tricking their husbands. Again, I don't know. Well, I don't know. What do you think? Like, who is the sympathetic character in this text? Yeah, it's possible that, right, you never see a woman's face when she shows up in public. So, yeah, she could have disguised herself. Like, we like to think that you would recognize someone's voice if you've been living with them. But maybe not, right? Maybe that's easy to disguise. It's possible. Right, so who, who's sort of like the sympathetic character in this story? Or is anybody sympathetic in this story? Sympathetic? Well, he was trying to legislate what she did with her body. It was. It's true. I feel like that's pretty contemporary terms for these things, but yes, right. So, from our, it's hard for me to read Rabbi Chia. Like when Rabbi Chia says that, it's like, well, that's easy for you to say. That's why she didn't want to ask you, right? Mm -hmm. Like, but I'm not sure. There's some chance that the, the Gemara, right, is like, oh yeah, poor guy, right? Um, yeah, he's like, she makes she makes really great babies, right? So I think that it's it's sort of like, right. 
maybe at the best they're sort of both sympathetic here. Um, but right, this the thing that allows them to the not recognizing them, even if it's plausible under the social circumstances, it does seem to stand in for a lack of direct communication between them as it did in our other story, right? Um, he had so he has twin boys and, and Pazzi and Tavi are girls. So he has two sets of twins at the end of the story and one, two boys and two girls. So he's already fulfilled through a group. And maybe, I don't know if he had other children also, but um, that's why. So it's interesting. She also doesn't ask do I have to, you know, like now in discussions of contraception, it's like, who's responsible for whose fulfillment of what mitzvah? She doesn't care about that. She's just like, if I don't have to have more babies, I'm not going to. But maybe that's because he could have, in theory, married someone else if he needed to. Um, so, right. So when are the girls born? I think that, um, so Yehudim Chizkiah to Omim Hayu is sort of a weird introduction here. But I think the way to read the story is, right, Yehudim Chizkiah were, were brothers, right? And they're twins. And they have this big problem. And you had really difficult pregnancies. So I think the assumption is the sterilizing potion works, in which case she's already sterilized herself. She doesn't have more. And he says, I wish I could have had another pair ba or another batch, basically, right? Um, then the sort of the Gemara steps in and explains, right? What does another batch mean? He already has two batches. Right? That's why he says it that way. As opposed to like, most people, if they have twins, wouldn't say another pair because they would assume that the next pregnancy would be a singleton. Um, but like, he's sort of, his saying that is like an indication that he like, he thinks that that's just what she does. She makes twins because he has sort of, tra she has a track record of making twins, not just one time. I don't know. Um, that, that's sort of how I read it. It could be not that way, but I think that, right. It's interesting that like, there's no, she's not interested in his obligation at all. Um, so the, maybe the simplest reading is that because he's already fulfilled it, well, maybe not. Okay. Um, so this is a pretty famous, I'm gonna to go to the last, I, I promised something a little happier. Um, so this is a, a pretty famous story. I should have brought it down. It's, a, it's, the, the, um, it's the subject of a very nice children's book called Drop by Drop, a story of Rabbi Akiva, which maybe my mother has read to my children a few times. Um, no, I don't know. It's a great story um, or it's a cute story, I would say. And it um, it dramatizes this in a, in a nice way, but, um, it's part of a longer So yeah, I'm not gonna do the whole thing. I, what I wanna do is just read this story of Rabbi Kiva and, her, and his wife, right? If one of the themes that's coming out of these stories is like that a gap and an inability, inability to sort of talk about either your intimate relationships or sort of like the, the foundation of your family relationship, right? Is corrosive, right? It's sort of like, I don't know, and came out from our stories previously also, do we have examples of people who have good communication, right? So I think we have a few. Um, one of the issues that comes up is that, right, for many of the rabbis, like for Rabbi Chia Bar Abba, right, like your primary loyalty and almost like spousal devotion is to the Torah, right? Um, so then where does your wife fit into that is always sort of a challenge for them. So we're gonna, I'm gonna come back to that thought in a second, but here, this story of Rabbi Akiva appears in a context that we'll look at later of men who leave their wives to study Torah and what happens. Let's just say that. And the rabbis give permission to leave your wife for a long time. And here's a story of a man who left his wife for a long time. Okay. Um, so I'm going to, the, the version that's most common that we're going to, the context that I was just describing is in Kichibo, but there's another version from, um, Nidarim, which I think is very, it has this, this little X, it doesn't have a parallel in, um, in Kajubo, so I'm going to read it, because it's cute. Um, so Rabbi Akiva, eat kadisha le barte de bar kalva bar, or dor de kalva sivua, right? So Rabbi Akiva, and it's already interesting, right? Eat kadisha le, she became betrothed to him, the daughter of the son of kalva sivua, or the daughter of kalva sivua, right? Um, Shama kalva sivua, or like, Kalva is sort of a, or Bar Kalva depending on the source, right? Whoever it is, is the, a wealthy father, the wealthy landowner, his daughter falls in love with the farm boy, the Princess Bride fans, and, or the shepherd or whatever he is, right? He's sort of, in other stories, he's, so he's poor, right? And she falls, or I don't know, falls in love, maybe I'm reading too, I'm putting too much on it, but she becomes interested in him. She becomes betrothed to him. It's interesting that it doesn't say Rabbi Akiva betrothed her, right? She becomes betrothed to him. So she's already the actor of the first verb in this story. Um, and 
her father finds out or, or whoever it is and he Adra hana mikol nachse, right? As we learned in the first class, right? One of the things you can do if you're angry with someone is you may take a vow that legally forbids them from benefiting from any of your stuff, which is a very strong way of cutting them out of your life because you can't undo it unless you get some sort of rabbinic sanction, right? Azla um, bisutu, right? So she went and she married him anyway, right? Um, sorry. The situ havagano betivna, right? In the winter, they slept in a storehouse of straw. And when he would, when they would wake up, he would like pull the straw out of her hair, right? And he said, um, right? And he said, if only I had the money, I would buy you this sort of like fancy headdress called the Jerusalem of Gold, which is going to be the the literary linchpin of this story. Like this, it's like going to be the bookend, as we're going to see, right? So first of all, like this image doesn't. I imagine some people have heard the story of Rabbi Kiva and his wife and all that before, maybe even in the class that I taught, right? So this part of the story often doesn't make it in because we usually teach it from the other text. Um, so that's kind of interesting already. So he, I, I just think this image is very, it's very tender, right? Like they wake up, they're sleeping in a barn basically, and he pulls the straw out of her hair and he says, I wish I could provide more for you. Um, and she doesn't seem to mind, right? She may, she is clearly like an active player here who chose to be with him, even though she kind of could have maybe expected the consequences, maybe not. Um, okay, one day, Eliyahu id mi lahon ke ansha, right? Um, so Eliyahu shows up, as opposed to Satan showing up and tricking people here, Eliyahu shows up and he takes on the form of a person. Um, the Kakari Abava, and he's, he's calling at the door. My wife just gave birth and I need some straw. Um, you know, I, you know, basically like I'm even worse off than you because not only do, right, like I don't even have straw, unlike you guys. At least you guys live in a barn. Maybe I live in like a nothing, right? A garage, right? And furthermore, like my wife just gave birth, which is much harder than you. And like, I need a little bit of straw. It's like their only resource. And Rabbi Akiva says to his wife, see, like he doesn't even have straw. Um, Right. Right. Look at this guy. He doesn't even have straw, meaning like, I guess we're better off than some people. Right. Um, we should maybe we should be happy with what we have. And she said, go be a student of Torah, which is such like a, a non sequitur in some ways. Right. In other versions of the story, it's a little bit less of a non sequitur. Um, you know, she, she only wants to marry him if he learns Torah or something, or that's part of what attracts her to him. But here it's clearly, it seems to me like it clearly sets up their relationship as sort of pre-existing. And it gives us this, like, I mean, the straw leads into the story with the poor guy and whatever, but like, it basically like, it's just a portrait of their intimate life with no sort of message yet. Right. Um, and then she says, go study Torah. So he does. Right. Azal, so he got, I'm going to read in English because this is very Aramaic and I'm not sure that there's much of a value at, right? He went and studied Torah for 12 years before Rabbi Eliezer and Rabbi Yehoshua, right? Um, and there's other texts that sort of talk about how basically he learns everything that they have to say. And then he, um, you know, he has, he sort of starts challenging them. He becomes like their most sort of gifted student. What does the straw symbolize? I mean, that's an interesting question. Other than like, the first connection that I would make is to um, to Mitzrayim, where the Jews have to collect their own straw. It's sort of like the most basic thing, right? That like, if you don't have straw, you really have nothing, but straw is really not that much. But other, other than that, I'm not really sure. I don't know if anyone else has any thoughts. Well, tell us in the chat if you do, right? So he goes and studies with these two big rabbis of his generation. After 12 years, 12 years is a long time. We're going to see that there's like an anchor number that is much less than 12 years for how long you should stay away from your wife, right? After 12 years, he's coming home and he hears his wife having this conversation, which is basically like, look at you. Your father was right to excommunicate you because this husband of yours is obviously no good. He just abandoned you for 12 years to learn Torah, right? Um, and she said, um, <clears throat> right, um, she said, if you would listen to me, you'd be there for another 12 years. Meaning like, actually you're wrong. Maybe, right, I told him to do this and I would be happy for him to do more even though I'm sitting here in crushing poverty, okay? Um, Rabbi Akiva said to himself, it seems again, right? Since she gave me permission, um, I'm gonna go back for more. So he goes back and said he's another 12 years um, and this 12 plus 12 generates the 24,000 pairs or something, right? 
or maybe 24,000, which is 12,000 pairs or something, right? That, those numbers floating around in other stories of Rabbi Akiva, for those who are familiar, right? So he comes back. And, so he doesn't even go in the house, which is kind of amazing, right? He turns around, he goes back, he shows up with like this throngs of students and everybody goes out and is like, Rabbi Akiva, amazing rabbi. He's a big rabbi. He comes, right? The whole world goes out to see him. And she even, she gets up to go visit him. Right? And that bad guy from before said, he's like, where are you going? They say, where are you going dressed like that? Um, but where are you going? I mean, like, it, even if it's not about her clothes, in the other story, it's, it's more like she borrows a nice dress, I think, to kind of like go out. But, right, he's basically saying like, this is not your story anymore. You think he's your husband, but he hasn't been here for 24 years. And he basically just came to town with his new wife, i.e. the Torah and his students, right? Like, this is not you. You don't belong there. Where do you think you're going? But she said, Yodea Tzadik Nefesh Behem Tov which is always, I think, a little problematic line in the story, but I have something to say about it in a second, right? She said, a righteous man regards, or not regards, but knows the life of his beast, meaning, don't worry, he hasn't forgotten me, okay? Um, how do we feel about that line as her saying about herself? Or like, those of us who are married may not regard ourselves as the beast of our husbands, right? We might not use a metaphor like that. Um, so, a, yeah, I don't know what to do with that, but I, I saw a suggestion. This doesn't, this does not work with the text of the Bavli as we have it, but I thought it was a very interesting suggestion, I think by Jeffrey Rubenstein, who said, maybe originally, I think this may even be true in some of the manuscripts, it just said Yodeat Sadiq. There's actually two Psukim that start Yodeat Sadiq in Mishle, right? One of them is this, Yodeat Sadiq Nefesh Behem To, and one of them is in footnote number one at the bottom of the page, which is Yodeat Sadiq Din Dalim right, Rashali Avim came down, right? So like a, a righteous person knows the sort of, in this case, I think it means like the situation of the most sort of poor people, the paupers, right? So in which case she's saying like, if, if the neighbor really is saying, where are you going dressed like that? Who do you think you are? And she says, right, Rebbe Kiva doesn't care what I wear, right? Like he understands that that's not what's important. Um, so I thought that suggestion was kind of interesting as like, it's not even necessarily about their relationship so much as sort of her rejecting the premise that like their material well-being is what's going to define them um, and not calling herself an animal. That's a bonus. Um, right. So I think the text does not disapprove of what she's done because she's going to be, um, she's going to be vindicated at the end as we're about to see. Right. Um, so she says that she goes out she goes out to present herself to him, maybe similar, this is like the bookend to Eid Kaddish, like she betrothed herself to him, or she became betrothed to him, so she presents herself to him, Kamid Chamla Rabbanan, and the rabbis, meaning his students, are like, who are you, go away, similar to what the the neighbor kind of tried to say to her, is like, this is not your, like, what are you doing here, I don't know if it's because she looks so poor, or because she's a woman, or all of the above, right, and they never, they don't know who she is, right, he said, leave her alone. Everything that I, you and I have is actually hers, right? Um, meaning, why is it hers? He recognizes her. For sure, he recognizes her, first of all. After 24 years of not seeing her, he, they have this connection, right? In some ways, Nefesh Behemto, notwithstanding the animal connection, works. It's sort of like, he's going to know me even if he doesn't know what I look like, or even if I'm 24 years older. Right, like we have a connection that doesn't depend on our sort of external trappings, right? So first of all, he recognizes her. Why does he say with my, uh, mine and yours is hers? Because she, she was, gave up everything to create what he has and in following his students, it's, it's all dependent on her. Right, because it's not just that she gave up everything, right? First of all, he's, she's the one who told him to go study. He would never have gone to study without her and he would never become a rabbi. But I think it's more than that. It's also that he recognizes that he couldn't have studied for so long if she had not been willing, right? It's not just that she made him do it initially, but that he needed her permission the whole time, right? Or her sort of tacit, not tacit, but her sort of like invisible encouragement to do it. And without her, none of this would be possible, right? Um, okay. And now here comes the redemption, right? Shema Bar Kal, not the redemption, but in some ways, right, that's like, that's where the story ends for a lot of people, right, because that's like such a lovely line, what's mine and yours is hers, and like, you know, the reception of this story in the Kolel world is very interesting, right, we all want to be like Rachel, Rabbi Akiva's wife, who didn't care how poor she was, she wanted her husband to study Torah, um, I mean, I'm saying like, 
some people think that, right? Um, so this is sort of a nice end where he sort of validates her and that's great. But the story, um, for better or for worse, wants to sort of fix all of their problems as well. So Shammai Bar Kabbalah her father, hears that this big rabbi is in town, right? So he comes and asks to undo his vow, right? He has to say, if only I had known, maybe he says, if only I don't, Rabbi Kiva was going to be a big Talmud Chacham. When I met him, he couldn't even read, right? So um, he says, if only I had known, he undoes his vow and he leaves a lot of money to Rabbi Kiva and his daughter, right? And they all live happily ever after. And in another version of the story, Rabbi Kiva then buys her, or maybe it's this version in the dot, 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 Rabbi Kiva buys her the headdress that he wishes he could have bought her at the beginning, right? So like, it seems like she's validated. Very much so, right? Her father was wrong and he realizes he was wrong and undoes his vow. And then they have both spiritual and material riches and it's awesome. Um, an interesting question is, if her father had not excommunicated them, would he ever have learned Torah? I don't know. Um, I don't know what people think about that. But I think- yes, so they have for, spiritual and they have Torah, they have wealth, but they don't have an interpersonal relationship still. So it's interesting, right? They don't have a day-to-day -day relationship, but I think that part of the point of the story is that they do have some deep interpersonal connection, right? And part of the point is, right, even after he leaves her, like, they, you know, it's true. For 24 years, they didn't have these cute, like, morning pillow talk, like, oh, let me take the straw out of your hair situation. But it seems like they were connected in some way. And when he comes back, he tries to pick that up in whatever way he can now, right? He's not just like, well, I'm back now, but I'm still going to be a rabbi all day. He's still tries to do things for her that are nice, right? Um, so I want to say a few things about the story. First of all, this story appears in a larger context, which you can look at, which is about the sexual obligation of men towards their wives. Um, and um, there's a line in the mission that says, right? The question is how frequently do men have to have sex with their wives, right? Let's assume that their wives want to, right? Um, so, meaning it's a service they provide for their wife, essentially, right? So Talmidim, which is Talmidei Chachamim, right? Torah students can go learn Torah for 30 days without permission of their wife. Meaning there are set times, right? If you're like a, a caravan guy and you come home every six months, so it's every six months. If you're like a painter or whatever, there's all sorts of different rules. Um, and Talmidim, right? Basically like your wife has no claim on you for less than 30 days. Even if she doesn't want you to go, it doesn't matter, learning Torah is more important. And the Gemara says, um, I'm a Rav Bruna, I'm a Rav, halacha, sorry. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I may have slightly, right? Sorry. I'm a Rav, I'm a Rav, I'm a Rav. Zuti be Rav Eliezer, about chachamim amrim ha-talmidim yotzim le-talmun Torah, shtayim u-shlosha shanim, right? This Mishnah is the minority opinion. The actual halacha is you can leave your wife shalom beer shoot without permission for two or three years, right? And then come back. So this story appears in that context. On the one hand, it's trying to validate that claim. But on the other hand, I skipped a bunch of stories. Here I just brought one, which um, Ruth Calderon has a very nice reading for, when, for those who remember when she was inaugurated into the Knesset and she read this story. Um, I think we're not going to learn it. This is not going to be a thing that I'm going to leave for next week. So maybe it is, but you can read it on your own. Um, right? Rabbi Chumay is one, in some ways one of the best stories. It's followed this mission, this claim, right? The halacha is men can leave their wives for two or three years. I'm going to finish in one minute. Sorry. Right. Um, but if you really need to go, I'm not offended. Right. You can leave your wife for two or three years without her permission. And then it's followed by a series of stories of men who did that and they or their wives die. Right. Which suggests maybe it's not such a good idea. Right. It seems like the sugi itself is aware that this halacha does not always generate the best outcomes in real life. And then you have the story of Rabbi Akiva, which is trying to redeem it. But the interesting thing is, right, it redeems the idea of sort of abandoning your family life for Torah study, but not as phrased in the mission of Shalob shoot without permission. Because the thing that allows it to be redeemed, right, that allows you to sort of have, um, you know, have your deep, really deepest relationship in some ways be with the Torah is the fact that your wife is okay with it, right? And that this is sort of like, we may or may not later see there's 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 a few stories of sort of rabbis with scholarly wives who talk Torah with them. And that can kind of like import your wife into your Torah world. And that's how you can have a good relationship with her. But here she's not really imported into the Beit Midrash, but the base, it's sort of the building block is that they can talk to each other and share values allows them to be sort of a pair despite being apart, as opposed to so many of our other couples who despite being together are sort of not together. Um, so I thought, I hope that that's sort of, um, 
And I think, furthermore, I think that the, the Gemara knows that, right? The way it presents these stories is it gives you this rule. It gives you a bunch of people who follow the rule to bad effect. And by giving you this story, it's not only redeeming the idea, like Rubenstein says, right? It's, it's trying to redeem the idea of, of rabbis studying Torah all the time and sort of abandoning their family. But it's not just redeeming that. It's redeeming that as a joint endeavor where women's sort of consent or participation is necessary. Um, and so I think that like, right, th this sugya, yeah, to me, it's not like just our, as modern readers, we want to read it that way, but it's very much sort of one of the things that makes Rabbi Akiva work is that he's on, his wife is on board and all these other rabbis who didn't seem to think it mattered whether their wife was on board, that was sort of their undoing. Um, that's what I have to say. I'm going to stop the share so I could see everybody's beautiful faces or lack of faces as the case may be. Um, and I appreciate all of your thoughts as always. So like I said, next time, hopefully um, I'm going to do a little, a little different, not rabbis and their own wives necessarily or human dignity in their own marriages, but sort of the way they read some biblical marriages and how some of the same themes come out. And it was a pleasure as always. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. And I do want to give a quick, Quick plug to our other fall classes, please go to www.drisha.org slash classes and you can see the full list of our fall programming in addition to this, of course, fantastic class with Miriam. So thank you again, everyone for joining.